All right, Nick, I want to talk about suede. Are you into it? Let's talk, let's talk about suede. Let's go there. Today, we're going to talk about suede. We're going to talk about new buck, split suede, rough out, wax flesh. You ready? I'm ready to go. Oh, I'm God. ready to go. Let's do it. I want you to explain to me what is suede. Suede is just the the flesh side or the inside or the underside of the hide. So the part that has the the nap associated with it. Or it can be a split, which means like the top, the grain part where the hair was is split away. So then you would have suede effectively on both sides. So it can, it can come from two different places. Yeah, nubuck is if you, because nubuck isn't really a suede. That's like, that's just leather that's been sanded to remove the grain. And then you've left the sanded surface ex exposed so it has sort of like a like a micro suede like an ultra suede kind of look and feel to it i see so i was in my mind i was considering all of these things to be suede so here, here's where my brain was and please correct me so you could take the rough out flesh side of the animal take a little bit of sandpaper buff it to be of a prescribed nappiness but you could also do that same thing to a split you can do that same thing to the grain. So you would would you say that a suede grain, aka new buck, is a suede? I don't not in a traditional sense, not in my brain. Because there's no if you are getting to the point where it's it's a suede, like it's a true suede where it actually has a nap to it, like a like a nap that would stand up and not just like a like a micro nap, like you've taken away all the grain and it's like almost a split at that point, I guess. Or and to me, a new buck is you've left that top layer intact, but you've, you've sanded it, all of the very outer part of it away to give it to, to give it like a, so that it has like a silky texture to it. Okay. You should get across, you should put up a cross section of the, like what a hide looks like. I could do that. And people can see like what like what you have to buff through or sand through, how far buffing buffing and sanding are the same thing. What you would have to buff through to get to get to to get through the grain to then start to get into a fiber structure that doesn't have that wasn't exposed to the like the outside world, so it's not quite as dense and sealed up. I'm gonna read to you the AI generated definition. Oh, this was, <laughs> the document you sent me was AI generated. <laughs> Of course, you think I wrote this? No, no, I know that you didn't because there's so <laughs> many errors in it. <laughs> there's yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's that's actually an interesting. Part, I guess I'll back up. Is before we got on camera here, I was doing, and for the last week or so, I've been considering this topic, but more recently, watched some YouTube videos about suede's and new bucks, and I feel like there's a lot of partial information. So I guess that's the goal here is to sort of explain a little bit about what these terms mean and i'm already getting called out because i thought a new buck was a suede um, i mean i get I mean some i mean someone might think that i guess i just don't because it because it can a, a suede has no grain associated with it at all and the new buck could have grain and you could call a new bro, new buck a top grain leather because it's still associated with the grain where a suede has nothing of the sort unless you're going to call like a like a rough out, like a full grain suede, which is kind of a weird thing to say because you've got like the grain on one side and the suede on the other. But we'll go but, there. Yeah, I mean, there's let's yeah, define some yeah. terms then. So we're, the plan will be to define these terms, and then I want, given that you own a leather tannery, to go into some of the nuts and bolts of you know how these things are achieved and why people might give a shit. <laughs> you know, like why would you want this new buck or suede or something in a product? But before we get there, I'll I'll give you this AI generated definition of a suede. A suede is derived from the inner layer of the leather hide. Suede boasts a soft and delicate texture. It typically comes from an animal like a cow, a sheep, or a deer. How's that definition? I mean, there's some problems with it, but it's, let's go there. Oh well, I mean it it is derived from the inner layer. I guess and I wouldn't describe it like that, but it is and but it's not necessarily soft and delicate. That's a that's a that's a function of how it's been tanned and then what you've done to it after tanning and 
and what you put on it even. You're and saying you could make a firm yeah, of course. tough suede. I mean, you could make you could make like a rawhide suede if you wanted to, which would be like a or like a like even like a you can make a vellum suede, which would be like a piece of paper. I mean, it's, it's not that's not that's not inherent to suede. That's inherent to like the leather and the the person that's making it. All right, and new then book. in terms of oh sorry, in terms of it typically it typically comes from animals like cows, sheep, and deer. I mean, I, I guess, but it comes from I mean everything. You can make suede out of anything, really. Well, not anything, but many, many things beyond those three. And I wouldn't, I mean, I maybe cows, sheeps, sheeps, <laughs> maybe cows, sheep, and goats. Um, would most be common. Most, I, yeah. I, I, but they use grain on goat. I, I don't know. It's not, this is, this is, I'm sh- already showing my ignorance as a suede tanner because we don't really do, we don't do any true suede, really. We do rough outs, which I'm sure we'll get to, and we do new bucks, but. But this like a true traditional suede where you're buying the product specifically to make a suede. We don't really do a ton of that. So I'm going I'm to be making it up a little bit as I go. Okay, I'm going to go there before we get to the definition of new buck. Are you, are you saying that a true suede can only be a split suede, meaning that the grain... Okay, I'll back that up too. You start with a full hide substance and every tannery has to do a process called splitting which gets that uneven, unevenly thick hide to a consistent thickness and you generate two parts. You generate the grain side which is you know, the most prized for the grain and then you also generate something called a split which is sort of the excess byproduct. Are you saying that that excess byproduct, the split, is the only true suede in like a traditional definition no no i don't think it's because because a rough out is a suede but i think that i think that the majority i I don't even i I would be guessing at like percentages but the vast majority of suede that's out there and certainly like the higher end suedes that i'm aware of generally are made from splits and splits sort of get they get kind of a bad rap just because of i mean it it technically is a byproduct of like a top grain or a full grain leather. But that's not to say that it can't be like a really nice product. I mean, we like CF Stead in in the UK is a fantastic suede tanner and their products are not low quality or inexpensive and they tan a lot of splits. But they also source very specific splits, at least as far as far as I know, very specific splits that are thick and meet their requirements. So it's um so I guess when you think when you think of like a dress shoe suede, I think it, from what I know, is almost always or is always a split. Just like a super tight nap, very fine, which is not necessarily easy to achieve. Right, right for a dressy suede. Okay, uh, new buck as defined by the AI overlords is a top grain leather is obtained from the outer layer of the hide. It undergoes sanding to raise the nap and create a smooth surface. New buck is often sourced from cowhide. Any qualms? Uh, <laughs> pretty good. I mean, it's it's fine. It's a. Uh, I mean, you could say if it if the AI is going to say after everything, it's often it's usually or often sourced from cowhide. Like you can just say that about every leather. <laughs> because okay. it is often they are all often bovine in nature but no i think that that's fine that's a fine starting place okay can you i guess i didn't ask the ai to define a rough out um, but maybe you could explain what a rough out leather is as well as a wax flesh so they're they're the same but the rough out the wax flesh goes through an additional process so the rough out just means you've taken a full grain piece of leather and for a variety of reasons instead of using it grain out you're going to use it flesh out so you're using the natural using the full thickness you're not splitting the grain off and then you've used you turn it basically inside out and there are there are advantages and disadvantages to that and then the which we can get into it but then the the waxed flesh is you do all of what I just talked about but then you put like a wax or a resin coat on the suede side which is you know the the opposite the inside 
and it gives it a smooth, you know, a smooth surface in the beginning at least. But then as it starts to wear, you start to get the the nap that's underneath that's been laid down by that waxing or that that coating starts to stand up and you get a sort of a very specific and unique aging effect. There's some pretty huge dorks that watch the sh- watch their show or listen to the show here that probably know what this is. Uh, so props to them if you know what marine field shoe is. But it's my understanding that marine field shoe is a rough out version of Chrome Excel and it's purposefully suede on that rough out side to have a suede appearance. But it's sort of like a, a coarse suede. And I guess the point I want to make is I think that coarse suede is super cool looking, but it's much more coarse than a new buck, which I actually think is less cool looking. It's just, I guess it's all personal taste. I, I find a, a new buck to be less interesting than a, like a even shaggy, like rough out chamois that you've done with Alden before. Like I think the like super gnarly suede stuff is pretty cool to an extent. There's some, there's sometimes it gets a little too much. I, I require like a little bit of finessing and, and a little bit of treatment and sanding on my rough outs for, to meet my taste. Um, and then the, the wax flesh Chrome XL is also wildly popular. Maybe I really want you to explain the story of how that Marine field shoe came about because I think it's awesome. Sure. Yeah, we, we did. I think we talked about it at length in one of the like historical tangents or excerpts we wanted to for like a I don't we can I don't remember which episode that was. I mean all I wanted to do is talk ago. about World War II so we can yeah. <laughs> just do that if you want. Uh yeah. Uh yeah so yeah Marine Field shoe is just natural chrome XL that gets finished for use on the flash side on the on the suede side. So it has a natural color, has like a sandy color to it. And that is that was used extensively in world war ii in north africa to for all of the marines they wore those shoes and the the idea was is that it was the right color but also it didn't require a lining so the since the the smooth you know normally finished and exposed chrome XL part is inside the boot like that's a very nice smooth thing to have against your foot and if anything ever got into the boot like sand you could just turn it you know, upside down and dump it out and there was no lining or there's nowhere for the sand to get caught. So it was sort of a, it made a lighter boot. It made one that was super durable because the suede had a grain associated with it. So it was strong. And then it also didn't, it was simple. It didn't have a lot of, there wasn't a lot of places for stuff to get caught and irritate people's feet. And yeah, so they, so they made, my ancestors made a tremendous amount of that for, a relatively short period of time, but, um, but yeah, and then the the waxed flesh came out of that because the a lot a lot of times they would get those boots in and they wouldn't you know they weren't really water resistant because the the water resistant grain part is on the inside of the boot now, and I mean the water was still or excuse me the leather was still water resistant because it has a very high oil content, but it didn't have the surface sort of treatment that would that would assist with that even further. So they would take, in the field, they would take dub in and they would put that on the, the flesh side, the suede side of the boot, and they would smooth that down with, as I've been told, like the bottom side of a Coke bottle, like a glass Coke bottle, because it was slightly concave. So they could, they could get like the surface like really, really smooth and waxed. And that, would, that had the effect of darkening them a lot. And they didn't even really look like suede anymore. So waxed flesh is sort of the approximation of that. So we sort of do do that in a flat piece of leather in the tannery and it makes it really uniform and flat and then you could make a shoe and you sort of f- skip the labor intensive step of having to do it with the coke bottle i've seen our past guest on the show george from oak street has been making marine field shoe boots i don't know why i said shoe and boots but i guess it's it's the name of the leather into a boot <laughs> it's slightly confusing He's been selling those marine field boots with Dubbin. And I think the Dubbin says, like, don't don't use this stuff because it's yeah. it's like 80 years old or whatever. 
Well, you'll and you like pretend like you. I think that most people would not be super happy with the result. They bought this boot that was like really nice and like creamy, sandy beige color, and then you start to rub this like dark waxy stuff on it, and it never is going to go on like totally even. But if you're you know if you're marching around and you want your boots to be waterproof, I don't think you really care as much what they look like. So it's a diff- different use case, I guess. I want to shift back over to Nubuck and yeah. talk about the difference between Nubuck and a suede or a rough out suede or even that wax flash. Again, like I really like a little bit, personally, I like a more coarse nap. But I also like the durability um, or I guess durability is not the right word, but it's, it's more of the ability to maintain its inherent appearance. Like it, it seems a lot easier to maintain that rough out look on a rough out suede, or I guess I should say it's easier to maintain a suede look on the rough out as opposed to the new buck stuff. If you scratch it up, I mean, you can certainly fill in a new buck scratch much more easily than a grain scratch. But I also like the break. You don't have the any potential to have the delamination and the creasing on the rough out stuff. So for me, I kind of like that more. And I guess my question is to you is, do you agree with that? And then why do you think there are so many work boots I see that are, are new buck as opposed to rough out? That's like 15 questions. <laughs> Do you like rough out or new buck? Yes. And do so you, I, I do like, why I do you do think like work rough. boots are new buck? Yeah. <laughs> so I do like rough out. I think that, yeah, you, the, a lot of the, the issues that people experience with break, which is, you know, bending the leather the wrong way. So you, you're bending it so that you're creasing the leather against the grain. You're, you don't have that with a, with a, like a suede or a rough out because there's no grain. To pull away or to get pebbly or to and even in the case of a rough out there is the grain but you don't see the grain and it's the, and then the the grain is sort of bending in the way that it wants to bend if that makes sense um so you're not you're not pushing it out because the you can edit this out if you want but the mm-hmm. the break becomes an issue because if you think of the like the structure of a hide and you've got all these different layers and then you've got the the grain at, at the very outside and that's kind of like the the most robust and the firmest part of the whole package so if you start to bend it and the grain part is being bent like in against itself then that has a shorter distance to travel than like the outside of it like if you just think about it as like a bunch of concentric circles so it, at a certain point it starts to pull away because it's the, it's traveling a different amount of distance. It's traveling a shorter distance and it's firmer. So it kind of, it's like kind of inevitable and it's an easy, it's kind of an easy thing to, to, it's an easier thing to picture if you have like a phone book or a magazine and you like take it and you start to bend it into a half moon and you look at the side that's, that's bending into the, the U shape it starts to want to like push away and like pull away from the rest of the pages. And like, that's kind of what's happening. So yeah, so you avoid a lot of that or all of that with um, a rough out or a suede. So you can cut that off if you want. <laughs> I mean, I but, followed you, but that's it's pretty it's, weed, it's weedy. Pretty, the only reason yeah, I could well, follow is because I've experienced it. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, yeah pretty, it's, that's it's a tough pretty, one. Um, the phone book's a good example. Yeah, so it's it, it, wait, but what's a, a phone book? Yeah. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's some people that are younger that listen to this and don't remember phone books hanging mm. underneath uh, in the phone booth. <laughs> We're very old. Crazy. Uh, yeah. How about new, yeah, buck, so, new buck on work boots? You into it? Like, maybe it's why? just cheaper. It's just mostly it's cheaper because you can, you can, and it looks more uniform because you can take something that's by sanding it, you're taking away that outer layer, which is where a lot of the, imperfections are especially if they're superficial so if you can sand through bug bites and and you know light scratches if you if you sand all that away all of a sudden you have a piece of leather that's still leather but it doesn't look like it's been all scratched up and scarred up and even though the performance characteristics of that scratched and scarred piece of leather might actually be even a bit better if you were to leave all those things intact and just live with the way that it looks i mean people want stuff to look uniform i get that i get that i get it both ways 
That's a big one for New Buck. I mean, people, and I get it. I'm starting to see it as my company gets a little bit larger and we are exposed to less dorks like people that listen to the show. (laughs) I call them leather nerds. But the people, some people just don't understand um, natural variances. So you're in the tannery, we would call it upgrading the leather. You, You can upgrade the appearance of the grain and sort of hide natural bug bites or scars, scratches by sanding down that grain layer and creating a new buck. Um, trade off though. I mean, you're trade you're trading something for that for that appearance. That's a pretty big trade off. It's. I mean, yeah. the other thing is like, I, so I I don't appreciate a new buck as much as a suede, but it is also a look. So like, if some people might really like that look, you know. And then I there's also like really cool leathers that are wax new bucks that I mm-hmm. also like. It's by the way, I, I did a brief live stream on our channel before getting you on here, asking people what if they had any questions. Um, is Predator a wax new buck? Um, no. I think I no. had that wrong. Yeah. No, it's buffed. It's buffed, but I wouldn't... It doesn't really get like a full... I wouldn't say we take it all the way to new buck, new buck land. Okay. Let me, let me yeah. define to you what a new buck is, Nick. And when I say uh, let me define it, I will let the robots define it. All right. Uh, I actually found this interesting. And if this is true, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the etymology of, of the, the name. New Buck, by the way, is spelled N-U-B-U-C-K, kind of like new metal from like the early 2000s. But like in the leather world, you know, it's like kind of badass. Uh, so N-U-B-U-C-K, one word, no space. New, referring referring to the fresh, youthful quality of the highs used, which I think I think I see where it's going with that. And then buck, meaning the skin, a nod to the buckskin, which was uh, the original material for suede leather. It's hard to know that. But I think, I don't know where this name came from. Do you know where the term new buck comes from? My bet is the word new kind of has a, a little bit in there where it's like refreshing the grain a little bit. It's like revitalizing the grain, creating it like new again. No, is this, is my reading? I mean, no, may, no, maybe. I don't know. I, I was just, I was, the name new buck is a delightful blend of words. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I forgot to read that part. The name new yeah, buck no, is delightful. Yeah, it's a, uh, no, I don't know. I think it's that, a weird, it's a weird word, which I think is also why it's worth explaining. Um, yeah. This says new buck leather I, traces its roots back to ancient traditions of leather tanning. Initially, it was crafted from the hides of young deer, specifically male deer, moose, or elk. These tender hides were ideal for creating the unique material. I don't know. Seems like maybe BS. Does it, wait, did it say ancient traditions of leather tanning? I'm going to push back on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think, I think that the more ancient you go, the less likely you are to have leather going, going through a process where you're sanding it. I think that, I think that, uh, I mean, maybe they flip it inside out to use the suede side for certain things that they wanted. If they had, a, if the, if the ancients had a reason to have like the grain against something, like you know, if they wanted it, you know, against their foot or whatever. But I don't, I, I think that, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Like, when was when's the first like where the hell did this word come from? Yeah. State, well, when's, what was the first recorded use of a of a of a new buck? And just like just the name of it alone makes like makes me think it was like in the in the time where they were making up wacky names, which is probably after. I don't know. I feel I, like I, I, I feel not that not that ancient. I guess is the yeah. I guess it, I was chatting with the AI here to get it to like have a conversation with me to see like where I could ask you questions. And what's weird is I feel like reading its response is kind of the same feeling I have after watching YouTube videos um, of people that don't work in tanneries explain these things, or it's like some of the story, but like mostly misleading, you know? Right. And that's, I guess that's how I feel with the AI. And it makes me worried about other things I've been looking for the AI to answer. Yeah. I think, yeah. It's like I some of that, it. <laughs> right. I think that we can, and I don't, this is like maybe um, something that we get to further in the conversation, but I think it's 
we should mention it is that like a new buck can also be like a transitional phase in the tanning process. So, cause, because you can, you can, a lot of leather out there, like you hear people call or call out or talk about like PU coated leather. It's so like polyurethane, like the, the, the base of those leathers are splits and new bucks. So they, they've taken, they're taking the, the, that base product, which is been tanned and has some strength to it. And then they're putting on a, a plastic or synthetic coating to it and like kind of laminating it on. And that's, that, that's like leather in kind of like leather in name only, like, cause you're getting, you're, you're kind of, it's like a composite of two materials. So the, that the outer PU coating is super consistent because it's plastic basically. And it has good water resistance because it's plastic, but it has no breathability again, because it's plastic. But I mean, that's like, that's what's in a lot of like athletic shoes and, um, or at least was. So that's, so the do at that point, it's almost like the sanding is akin to like roughing when you rough a piece of leather so you can glue it. You're mm -hmm. doing kind of the same thing there. So it's not a new book. Isn't always a finished state, I guess is, is what I want to acknowledge. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. Um, you were giving an example earlier about the phone book with the, the delamination. There was an example I was thinking of. So any, anybody that's a crafter listening or is curious about their products, if you're seeing two layers of leather together and one of them is a suede or a new buck and you're starting to see it become loose, there's a dynamic that happens with the temper between the two layers. And the example I'm thinking of is there was a belt maker that was buying some new buck from, from Nick. It was a product called Snuff Suede, which, by the way, is a great, great leather. If that Snuff Suede is too firm on a liner of a belt and the outside is softer than that firm inside, you will see pipiness and sort of coarse pebbling on the inside of the belt, which might not be desirable. So there's so anybody that's making a belt, that's two layers. Like, like I'm plan to do more of you want the liner leather to be softer than the outside leather so it has more room to give when it flexes yeah i mean you want it to be the same as the is the safest mm. like you want it to be the same temper the same softness because that's that's the well, the closer they are the more forgiveness you there is hmm but that's that's off the shelf i mean as soon as you start to wear something i mean they're gonna like the Something like a snuff suede versus like a shell cordovan. I mean, the the snuff suede is going to be get softer on its own a lot faster. So I mean, it just doesn't. But also, you know, who's seeing the inside of your belt? Like, just mm -hmm. wear your belt and relax. Yeah, that's just a good point. Yeah, I mean, it's a. T I get it though. You know, speaking of of cordovan belts, I've been I've been making the cordovan belts, the cordovan on the outside, and then the the horse butt strips, the edge mm -hmm. as the liners. If I want to do a different liner, what leather would you suggest as a liner on a shell belt? It's funny. We, my dad and I were just talking about this the other day, and we have slightly different opinions. He likes... He was saying, actually, like a, like a slightly new-bucked version of a Latigo. Um he likes because it's consistent and it's you can control the firmness and it's lighting you know the way we make it it's lighting color um so he liked that one you and, guys used to do some full grain latigo lined belts that were nice mm -hmm. yeah i did some of the one piece shell belts i did were lined with a full with a like a full grain latigo i thought i the the belt the i'm just speaking of the belts that i made and we sold and like the the one and two piece cordon belts we lined some in natural Dublin, which I thought were awesome, because there's no dye, so it doesn't come off, but it's waxy, so it feels like nice and premium. It sort of pairs well. It's got the same like tanning agents as the two, as the cordovan on the outside, but it is it is it's prone to that that break stuff, though. I mean, it can be get bumpy and pebbly and loose depending on how you bend it, where it's cut from. So you sort of have to know what you're getting yourself into. But I did, and I didn't care because I knew. <laughs> I thought it was going to be nice. It's cool. But also, I was only selling like 20 belts or 30 belts because there were not that many one-piece belts that are ever able to be made at one time. While we're on this, so I could, we're on this yeah. tangent of belts, I made a belt today 
I guess my team made the belt today that was two layers of Chrome Excel, and it reminded me of you. Where you gave me a two layer Chrome Excel belt maybe 15 years ago, and it's still pretty sweet. <laughs> kind of want to do some two layer Chrome Excel belts. They're good. Let's get back on the rails here, Nick. Okay. I want to talk about Wax Flush because I think it's just about the coolest effect once it's been worn in. It's sort of sometimes difficult to envision on a pair of shoes or something, how a wax flush uh, pair is, is going to wear in. Mm -hmm. But the pairs, the boots that I think are the coolest looking are wax flush after hard wearing. Um, I guess, I guess the question in here is color wise, all the surface color to me, in my experience, it seems to be pretty dark on the surface and that could be, a multitude of colors underneath is there any ability to control the the two layers of color sure i mean it doesn't and i think you're talking specifically about waxed flesh chrome xl which is what most people think of and well it's mostly what we make but you can make you can wax you know the suede or flesh side or the rough outside of anything i mean we've done a tub Latigos and done it in bright colors, and you can do it in different, like the Cavalier Chrome XL line, which is in which is brighter colors too. So it doesn't it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be dark colors. But the the traditional stuff that's based on like the Marine Field Shoe World War II concept that's all that all ends up being earth tones because the we've got the natural base which is kind of like a that sandy taupe color and then as soon as we put the wax on it even if there's no dye at all it starts to get dark pretty quickly and we could so and then we can only go darker from there so that's why it ends up being like kind of like a mid like a mid brown like or like a chocolate maybe like a milk chocolate brown or darker and that's I mean, you know burgundies and dark greens and dark blues and black and but yeah we can't there aren't there aren't a lot of ways to go or there really is no way to go lighter on that base what about like uh instead of going darker brown is there a way to make it like blue over the top sure or, okay yeah. yeah but you have to use i mean it depends on what kind of blue you want because we've done we did like an aqua blue a number of years ago and the only way to get aqua blue over taupe is you have to use pigment mm. so it ends up being so then you That'd end up having cool. this sort of it is it is cool you end up having it's it's specific though. You end up having like this aqua blue color, which is interesting on its own, but it has it has sort of a I mean like a like a pigmented look to it. But then you start to wear through it, and you get the sandy color underneath, which is again cool, but it's pretty specific. So I think it just depends on on what you what you're after. People that are familiar with the term T core and appreciate that look might want to consider a wax flush. I would say because I was. I guess I forgot to describe what it does. <laughs> but since those those suede fibers have been sealed off with resins and waxes and dyes, I guess, any material that Nick puts on there, it, it creates a smooth, um, flat surface. And then if you scuff up against like a brick wall or something, it, it removes all that material and, and you go back to your sort of suede look without any of the color. So you end up with this like beautiful contrast in textures and color which i think is super cool and i mean talk about i guess you wouldn't want to wear it to like a wedding probably i don't know maybe you would i would <laughs> but but like it doesn't have the like refined appearance of course but certainly has like a mega badass appearance in the way i don't know like the like the light parts of this denim are kind of wearing it it's the same sort of vibe right yeah so it's it's very it's definitely casual and yeah, it's I, I think it's cool. It's yeah, it's it it does you you're like knocking off all of it, everything the wax and a lot of the dye comes off and the nap stands back up. And there are a ton of people just go online and just search wax. I mean, I think that even in the stitch down patina contest, there's a in this year and years past, there's been a bunch of people that have worn that, and you can sort of see where it's. You can you that sort of you can see where it starts and where it goes. It's pretty. It's pretty striking. It's cool. I want to talk about water resilience on any leather, I guess, but with the the suede being more open and and nappy and fibrous, 
I would imagine that it's much more difficult to prevent water from soaking up in those fibers. But I also know that, or maybe maybe I'm mistaken, but are there waterproof suede that you're aware yeah, of? How does that definitely. work? It's just, it's done through what's in the leather. I mean, you can always put something on the outside to make it waterproof, you know, temporarily or, you know, semi-temporarily, but there are waterproofing oils that you can use that go in the leather that make it so that the water doesn't, it'll just beat up and roll off. It's pretty, we have a waterproof suede that does that. Ad- Adirondack? What's it called? Uh, that's, that is the waterproof new buck. Uh, new buck. Yeah. Orion. Orion. Oh yeah. 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 I was thinking of, um, it, when you talk about the materials that you put into the leather, I was, and I might have this, it's been a while since I worked for you, Nick. So forgive me, but please correct me. The swelling oils where you can tan certain oils into the skin. And then the moment that water molecules interact with them, they, they, the swelling oils swell and they prov- they like fill the hole from where the water wants to go. It's pretty, pretty fascinating. You got that right? Chemistry. There's a lot of chemistry. I don't, yeah, I don't get it. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, stuff you have to, <laughs> it's not, it's not waterproof until you get it wet. It's kind of like the weird. I'm glad I, I'm glad I chatted with the AI overlords here because I, I'm now recalling what I was talking about. And I was talking about chamois, which is, mm-hmm. which is a, like is confusing in its just pronunciation. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of back up as chamois, chamois. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, apparently there's like, those are legit definitions. I actually looked that up. Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you pronounce it? Yeah, so chamois is, is acceptable as an American English uh, pronunciation, as as well as chamois. And then chamois. in uh, in British English, chamois is the preferred pronunciation. Heads up, everybody, uh, specifically Ben from Stitch Down. All right, so sh- when I hear chamois, and I think of the chamois guy <laughs> that like dries off stuff with yeah. a, a cloth. I, is a chamois but i don't think that was actually a chamois i think that was maybe a synthetic yeah yeah alternative to chamois right right and i think of when i think of a chamois i think of something that people use to dry off a car right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but you also have a leather tannage product that you make called chamois and this is where i should should have said earlier with the oiled nubuck chamois is an oiled nubuck correct correct and i think Perhaps the coolest. and there's no resemblance to the traditional gammy. It's got no, yeah nothing to do with it. I don't even know how Other you guys than, got that. It's name. just like it's just like a a soft or I guess a, like a new buck that has oil and chamois is like oil. There's oil in the tannage. Yeah, it's not it's not a great. It's like it's like us having uh, a letter called kudu that has n- absolutely nothing to do with the <laughs> kudu animal. It's just like yeah, it's not great. <laughs> I, I think the coolest use of chamois was probably a mistake from our friends at Alden, of course, with it, which is now known as like rough out chamois. I think the earth color is the one I like. Reverse, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not intended to be that way. They might have cut it upside down by accident, but it's much nappier and more coarse of a, of a texture. And then with the oil on it, gives it this really beautiful sort of shimmer effect that that i appreciate um so i would i would ask you nick do you have any other favorite uses of chamois or is that is that the one um yeah no that's it's pretty good i mean that's that's probably the most overall it's pretty sweet easy, easiest to reference i mean i think i i like it i actually little i i like it rough out or flesh out but i like it the other way too i like it grain out so like the smoother side but either way it it burnishes a lot like it, it it's um it's a it's surprising how shiny it's veg it'll get it combo at, at yeah it, 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 how shiny it'll get at, at the wear points just from that additional i mean snuff suede will too which is so it's snuff suede becomes chamois when we cut when we coat it in neat's foot oil it's the only difference but the that additional oiling does a lot to uh for it does a ton to the feel and the color and and uh and also how it how it burnishes when you wear it but i remember when we were making a lot of that or for me at the time was a lot of that leather 
with your dad and I was asking him why, I was like, why don't you sell more chamois or snuff suede even? He's like, it's like very commoditized. Like you can kind of go a lot of places to get a new buck like snuff suede or even like an oiled new buck. And I was like, well, I was asking Skiff, I was like, well, how do you sell any of it? He's like, well, ours is better and just ages nicer. So for what it's worth, I, I don't have any other direct experience to compare well, to. And you don't have to buy a million feet of it at once. This is the other reason. And you can get custom, can buy, somewhat custom, custom colors. Custom, yeah, custom colors. And we have versions of it too, like you said, Adirondack, which is um, what, uh, like the waterproof or allegedly waterproof. And then there's Outrigger, which is like a waxed, instead of oil, we put wax on it. So I mean, there's a bunch of, it's like anything else that we do where it's like, you've got a base or a, a, any tanner for that matter. Potentially you've got a base and then you've got, you know, a hundred different things you can do to that base. And then each one of those kind of becomes its own product, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I looked up, I, I think I asked like, what tanneries make suede's? I think you'd be surprised that uh, I think this was Chat GPT said Horween Leather Company is the first result, and then Stead. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is that they gave they gave me a. Th- we should talk about CF Stead. Uh, I thought this was wild though. Uh, Taki uh, Tachiji Leather in Japan. Tachiji, yeah. I I did some skimming on them, but it seemed like they don't do suede. <laughs> it seems like they do like awesome veg. Yeah, I think that's... So it's weird years, that it like yeah. threw in yeah. them uh, <laughs> when I asked who makes suede. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, AI. But I know you are um, friendly with CF Stead. What's your relationship with them? And maybe tell us a little bit more about CF Stead. Um, they are another tannery. There you that's go. Like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, they, we, so we, we do mostly our the vast majority of what we do are grains, like full grains. And then, you know, different, different surface preparations to the grain. And so people come to us for that stuff. And stead is kind of the opposite where they, the most of what they do, at least historically, they've been doing more grain stuff lately, but is for suede. So we have a very, there's a lot of overlap in our customer list. So we share, like in uh, in Milan at the Leather Fair at Linea Pella, we show we share a booth with them because people people are often coming to talk to both of us, and it's just a way for us to be economical, but also it's just I don't know. Yes, yeah, so we've had a relationship with them for a long time, and then the yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. I just feel like the naps that they're able to achieve are pretty extraordinary, and I. I'm not, I have mild experience with suede's and producing them, but um, it must be to do with their tannages as well as their buffing buffing methods that are able to give them such a tight nap. Um, so anybody, shaving, yeah. yeah, anybody that's experienced, um, you know, again, Alden, it, I think a lot of their suede's are from Stead. And it's an it's, it's extraordinarily tight nap. In a way, and that, really good, and really good colors too. Yeah, they, they've got they get like really good rich colors, and there's a there's a bunch of ways that they a bunch of things that they do to achieve that. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I just good, remember I remember trying to make some suede look similar to theirs in, in your buffing department, Nick, and we we couldn't get close. Sadly, no, we can we can get close in like half of the skin, and then the other half is like all <laughs> shaggy and not usable so it's not really interesting at that point so there's it's special yeah no it's it's, it's they, they're they are uh experts for sure um maybe you can jump into leather care how you would care for these different things um or is it all the same i was i had a question in the youtube live stream before this of exactly this like how do you care for this stuff yeah so me my i know how, to, how i care for our stuff i think that like the the, rep- the suede reputation of all, like you can't get it wet. And as soon as you get it wet, like it's that Seinfeld episode where he's like wearing his jacket inside out, outside. It's like, it's got the pinstripes on it. Uh, I think that that's, I mean, it's not, it's not totally misplaced, but I do think that 
that it's not quite that extreme, especially if you're using if you're doing using like something that's like we we're just talking about instead, like something that's high quality. Like it can like leather gets wet and dried a lot during the process. So just like just getting it wet in a, in and of itself is not going to like destroy it, but it it is it's it's open. I mean, and there's nothing there's no wax or or you know, or or grain for that matter. That's that's there to sort of prevent stuff from soaking into it. So it's more prone. It's more accepting uh, of whatever is going to happen to it. And I mean, that just has the has the effect of it of, of it changing. So I think that when you care for a suede, there's not like you can't really do much other than just brush it, uh, or you can darken it. You can add oil or dye to it to make it darker, or you can just brush it with. I mean, pretty aggressive, much more aggressive brushes than you would use for like a grain, because uh, you're trying to revive the nap and sort of even it out and stand it back up. Um, yeah, and then and then and for the for like what we do for the marine field shoe, it's kind of the same. Like you just, it's not quite as refined, so you can be a little bit, and it's it's a very high oil content. So you've got sort of a a better shot, I guess, if something happens, if, if you get something spilled on it, cause it's gonna, it's not going to soak in quite the same way, but it'll still, it'll still end up in there, but it's going to, it all, it will also darken. And that's sort of the expectation anyway, is that that product's going to darken. And then wax flesh is just like, whatever, <laughs> you, whatever you want to do. <laughs> you I mean, the people all cook bottle it again. Yeah. People ask all the time. It's like, how do I make it look like it? How do I make it look like it did when it was new? And it's, you can't really because we're, we're putting it through like a what's effectively like a gigantic iron and it's flat and it's hot and the you know, like the 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 roll itself is like has like a mirror polish to it so that's a pretty specific and uh, controlled environment. You can use you know something that's waxy and like the back of a spoon um, and try to get try to bring it back a little bit, but you're never going to lay it like back down so it looks brand new. At least at least I haven't been, not been able to do that in my experimentation oh you tried yeah yeah i mean the the spoon trick works really well it's just as long as you like don't as long as you remember like the spoon is going to get hot when you use it after a while (laughs) because i always put my like put my my finger or my thumb like in the dish of the spoon and then you've got like this nice flat or this you know this rounded um surface that you can use and you can like get a lot of pressure going and which generates heat and you can Make that spoon very warm against your thumb. Have you ever used a suede eraser? Uh, I like have, a gum, like not, a gummy. Yeah, not. I mean, I have a little bit. Not. I mean, I think I think that the really stiff, like nylon brushes, are probably what I like the most. Like the really short bristled nylon brushes. I think you know, some people like the short, like the different sort of natural animal hair brushes too. And then there's even the, I think they're brass bristled. As like the other traditional, like they're really they're like that's even more abrasive, but yeah, you can go ham this, on this, it. We're going back into like the shoe care thing where it's like you should use what gives you the look that you like. Yeah. Yeah. How about washing them? I mean, it's how I guess it depends on the leather itself, but you're saying people are worried about water touching suede. Um, Just washing and cleaning in general? Yeah, I'm like, I don't know. Every boot I have accumulates dirt and dust on it i'm sure i don't have i don't think i have any suede i would like to get some wax flushed off but i i don't have any suede footwear so i don't have any direct experience with it but i imagine you would get some dirt on like a light colored suede might not look great you know i would imagine like a soap and water let it air dry but if if you don't want water to touch it maybe you're done <laughs> how do you deal with that yeah, i think it's pretty specific on the on the type the, the type of suede and then the color too depending on what you like if you've got something that's really light and you want to you want to stay really light for and that's that's your whole goal then i would say doing adding as little to it as possible so getting one of those brushes and using that to clean it off or even like a stiff toothbrush or whatever if you have to get into nooks and crannies um, like but i know there are a bit out of there I don't have a ton of experience, or I guess I have no experience with like the the suede like soaps or the suede like the saddle soap kind of type products that are specifically for suede. I don't. I've never actually experimented with any of those. But I, I wonder if you could just take some sandpaper to it and just like sand it off. 
I mean, you could, but you're going to change the nap. Like wherever, like if you're only going to stand one spot versus the entire thing, the nap will change yeah. and the color will change just in that spot. So it's a little, I would, I would maybe say, don't try that. <laughs> I should have said I mean, try, I've tried if you tried if you want, but you're I, I a think mad that, man. I think that, I think that, uh, I guess if you're going to try that, maybe try it on Marine Field Shoe and try it with, uh, like a coarse, like a really coarse sandpaper. So some of, the, try some of the partial information I was coming across that I was concerned of hearing a part of the story was that the durability question of, say, a split suede versus a new buck versus a full grain. I feel like we've covered this one to some extent too, but I guess I want to say, and maybe check me on this, Nick, is that a lot of the, the durability question depends upon the the leather tannage and not so much whether it's a split or a grain suede new buck or a rough out thoughts on that yeah i think that there's a couple of ways to look at that so i think that you can make full grain stuff that's garbage and you can make suedes that are fantastic and vice versa yeah. and i think that maybe the 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 way to compare the two is if you were to take like take a split and then take a piece of full grain leather. And if you were to tan them exactly the same way, what would the results be? And I think that you get, you get a certain difference in physical characteristics, but then you also have products that like, you might not like the way the suede product looks. So like you wouldn't use it. And if you were to tan a full grain piece of leather, just like a piece of suede, you might not like the way that looks either. So it's like, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bad, bad approach, but I think that you know this the with the the full grain leather is going to have as a general statement. If it's if you do the exact same things to it, it'll have more abrasion resistance and more tensile strength. But the suede will be, um, I guess, generally softer, but a, but a, you know totally consistent because there's no grain there's there's no you've taken out the natural like the the, sur the the surface that was exposed to the natural world that would have had that would have changed during the life of the animal let me let me so check you on that though because if, yeah. if you're saying abrasion resistance like isn't a rough out near infinite infinitely abrasion resistant i mean you could cut a hole yeah in i it, mean but. right i mean i mean like in terms of like if you were to Maybe I was thinking about that. Maybe that's a that's a bad way to to describe it. Like if you were to take a piece of sandpaper and like try to and like rub it across the surface of a full grain piece of leather, and then you take a sandpaper and you rub it across like the like a nubuck or a suede, and then you were to like put it under a microscope, I think that the leather mm -hmm. that the, the full grain of those three, the full grain would retain the, the most of its original attributes which i guess is kind of like a i guess i'm i'm picking nits but yeah i don't know it's, yeah. it's interesting that you describe it that way because i'm almost thinking you'd retain the appearance more easily on a new buck because you could sort of blend in that suede grain a little bit more easily than a grain which you can kind of never get back a scratch you know okay so let me maybe i'll say it a different way so if you were to if you were to do that test again i'm just gonna say i got gotcha. you <laughs> if you were to, if you were to so let's say you had a machine that could that could sand put the same amount of pressure in the same spot like a like a unmet like a, as many times as you wanted to i think that if you were to do that to a piece of full grain leather and a piece of suede it, that started out the same thickness that you would the the full grain piece of leather would last longer it is more robust that like you would like if the, the robot would end up having nothing to sand on the suede sooner than it would have nothing to sand on the full grain this okay. is, i'm doing a terrible job explaining this no no i get you i think you so, think you get it are you saying that so yeah like the ultimate goal is like i want a boot that's going to last a long time would i much rather have a full grain piece a suede a rough out suede or a new buck or does it matter I mean, so as long as you're like you're going to qualify it that they're of similar quality, I guess. Like you're yeah, not like, tough, right? Getting one, yeah. 
I mean, and, I think, like I guess you're comparing the, dif- in, the in addition to the the tannage that you're going to try to delineate there. It would also be like well, the appearance maintain the same because I think the grain one would have the least chance to maintain the same appearance, where the the rough out would have the easiest chance to maintain the same appearance. But for you know flexing and walking around and accidentally scratching them up, you know, are the things which would fall apart faster. I think it's, those are the two questions, right? All right. I think we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I, but again, it goes back to like the tangent itself too. I mean, like if you, like if you were to say, like compare, like if you were to make a pair of boots and one of them is regular Chrome XL and the other one is, I don't know, a new buck from, I guess from anywhere. I mean, the 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 Chrome XL boot is going to last longer, and it might it it's going to change in a different way. I, I think if you wear them the exact same ways, I mean they they both are going to change a lot. But the 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 leather that has the grain intact is going to last. It's just it just has more. There's more substance to it. There's more. I mean the the grain itself is more resistant and more resilient because that's the part that was like world facing on the animal and was designed to protect the animal from the elements. I mean, it's, and it does so it's doing, it's going to do the same thing when it's a piece of leather. Would you ideally. say using the same logic and this the same tannage, right? So if you were to take a four ounce piece of Chrome Excel and a seven ounce piece of Chrome Excel and use it in the same exact way, maybe you had one shoe be four ounce and one be seven. You're saying the seven would last longer because there's more substance. It depends. Did I get you again? Uh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, for the sake of like the internet, I'll just say yes. Yeah, it's a, it's. I don't know. Like, I think this is kind of nitpicking. On, like, yeah, it depends on the pattern. I mean, because like, like certain, like certain, certain like there's a reason that they that they spec certain weights for certain things, and you don't just be like, well, if it's five ounce, then if I order if I make it on a ten ounce, it'll be even better. But you know, it might bunch up. And that might be that might create wear points that are either uncomfortable or that wear inconsistently and rub more in different ways, and you get a hole in one spot, and that's why it should be five ounce and not nine ounce or whatever, whatever heavier weight. So I think it's, I don't know, it depends. I mean, and generally, I think that that the shoemaker, uh, like a reputable, high quality shoemaker, has chosen. I mean, they have a choice of weights, so they've chosen the weight that they want that works in the product that they're producing. So if you were to go to, you know, whatever shoemaker and say like, well, you make it in five ounce, what can you make it for me in seven? That I think that I think that the product that you would get in the, in the heavier weight would not be as nice. Generally, do you, have any, do you have any leather footwear that you've worn a hole in? Um, bottoms, Same. any uppers? Yeah, any uppers? Yeah, I've had bottoms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had an upper. Wore out that was a leather. Uh, I mean, I've worn, I definitely have worn like the grain off. I mean, maybe if I had kept a hole, them. like I don't know, my no, running shoes worn. have literal holes in the upper. No, I've never, but I, have, I, that's, that's an unfair question to me because I have a lot of, I, I have like, like a nice good, stuff and you were I have like, well, I, have, I can I have a, a million healthy pairs. rotation. Yeah. yeah so. So I've definitely be, seen. I would love holes, if, maybe if somebody happened. wants to leave a comment if they've actually worn through an upper because I wonder sometimes people talk about this durability question and like how relevant it is. And I'll, I'll flip it to the wallet world for a second. I see wallets break all the time, and that's why people come to me for a wallet. It the places where it breaks is with where, where the leather is purposefully thinned down and turned around an edge glued down and stitched down so i'd imagine you might see that on some shoe construction if there's ever that sort of binding effect it happens i mean it, i mean that's not really a hole though it like i've seen stitching tear like especially if a piece of footwear gets really old and isn't conditioned exactly right then stitching stitching can definitely because it's like a little perforation at that point so that the leather can tear on shoes you've seen this yeah on old on like shoes that have gotten like start to like Kind of break down a little bit, like I mean, it's shoes that are like, you know, decades old. You know what? Um, I have I have some boat shoes. They were the first run Oak Street 
I forget what they're called. Um, but I wore them all the time and like really aggressively and would step on them. Like I wouldn't even put my heel in it. I would sort of like just wear them as like a slipper. And I still didn't defeat the leather. The stitching has failed. Uh, so I guess that's where I'm at here is like, I wonder how much of this durability question is relevant if you're choosing like a... Yeah, it depends. I, I think the most, the, the play, as I was thinking and you, as you were talking, the, the place, and not, and not just, just leather in general, I don't think I've seen it on our stuff, but I've seen leather dill up holes like over steel toes. Like, so the, like, cause you got like, it's the front of the shoe, which is getting, which gets beat up like a lot. And then there's that really hard, like, cap, whether it's steel or polycarbonate or whatever, whatever your particular safety shoes are made out of. But then you end up with a hole that's, that sits over. So you expose like the safety, like the safety component of the shoe. I've seen that a bunch. Hmm. On, on like really nice leathers or like a, a leather that you're familiar with? No, I mean, not, not that I'm, nothing I'm familiar with off the top of my head but just like i mean they're their work they're like construction site like they're they're not like yeah maybe that's the problem with our like wear into the grocery our, store our perspective like is tables. like not not tough guy jobs i guess i don't know i've worked in the tannery for a long time but i wasn't like on my knees like scraping my toes and my shoes so much it's more of like abuse to the bottoms i guess yeah i guess we have of limited experience <laughs> I don't know. I've just I, yeah. I I've really those those uh, Oak Streets I'm referencing really put those through the ringer and did mm-hmm. not put a hole in the leather. And I, I wish I could explain the you know almost twenty years now of use on those, but it was pretty <laughs> like it was pretty unfair to wear them in the way I was wearing them. But they were so comfortable. I I remember wearing them uh, in the rain while moving. I'm like who wears poke shoes? <laughs> Like moving in the rain, no less. Like yeah, like I wore this shit. Ton of grip in those. (laughs) They're so awesome. They're so. I really like an unlined Chrome XL. Anything. Well, what did we miss on these topics, Nick? Um, Probably a lot. (laughs) Probably a lot. I mean, I'm sure it's. It's like anything else. There's there's just so many different ways. You know, I think that. Yeah, one one thing we didn't get into in, in large amount of depth is the process in which it takes to manufacture a suede. Mm-hmm. I know you were gonna you were mentioning it earlier today that you wanted to like ask your buffing department about that, but it's pretty straight up, right? It's like you can use different grits of sandpaper to it mm-hmm. to nap different the, yeah, different different um Yeah, so different grits. I mean it's just like it's just like a piece of would i mean it's like we we've made the comparison before so you know fine versus coarse grits you know how much pressure you know you're putting on it how fast you're going um i mean that those are all those all have big effects but there's there's a lot of stuff that happens that can happen a lot like a ton of adjustments that can be made in terms of sanding and buffing or sanding is the same as buffing but i mean the biggest thing that the biggest thing that people might not think about when you are making a suede or a new book is like how much you have to manage the dust. I mean, it's like the thing that we think about because it's like it just it's dusty. Tell it's me about dusty your different process. types of dust collection methods. Um, Which there sounds like are, a joke, but there are yeah. a bunch of different ones. <laughs> I mean, we, we have two. There's like just, there's wet and there's dry. So like it's a vacuum and like then the dust goes into something that has water or doesn't have water. And it's pretty much it i mean the the water one is nice because it doesn't catch on fire ever uh and the dry one is simpler but it's you know like it's if there's a you would never or one would never imagine that there would be like little pieces of like buckshot or whatever embedded in hides at times and there is and like if you are sandpapering a hide that has buckshot in it you can create sparks which if you then suck into a vacuum full of dust like is uh and blowing in be, fresh oxygen right well, out just it. like sucking in as yeah. much air yeah it's it's i mean it's the the like the dust collection site is outside of the building and like this big metal box specifically because it needs to be able to be extinguished if something like that happens but um but yeah i think that i think that the may, maybe the one thing 
um, I guess I just said one thing. Maybe the other thing that people don't think about with buffing is how widespread it is. I think that I think that it would be you could go through a, every single tannery in the world and probably almost all of them um, would do some type of buffing. Some type of sanding or buffing, whether it's the backside or the, I mean, the, the flesh side or the, uh, or the grain side. I just think it's like, it's, it's such a, I, I guess it's important. I mean, it's an important part of, of leather manufacture these days where you have the ability to take and sort of even out the surface of something to make it more consistent. Because that's the, that's the, like the kind of the name of the game with tanning is you're trying to make it as consistent as possible. Um, because that's what that's what the customer wants. I mean, they want. I mean, ideally, you get something that has no cuts or scratches, and it looks the surface is exactly the same across the entire thing. I mean, that's the easiest thing to cut. But I mean, obviously, it's a natural material, so we're trying to. We're it's our job as a tannery to manage that as much as possible, and then we've got the ability to sandpaper it. But there are massive trade offs there, so we have to sort of balance the uh, you know what's the end use and what do we want to look like. And I mean, to your point, and, uh, it, yeah. I I get customer complaints about pull-up and the inconsistency of because people don't understand it so it means i'm not necessarily good, doing a great job explaining it so i can only imagine i don't even know who's a huge like nike like how much is involved to create that same pair of jordans the same way every time it's a massive challenge so i completely understand all the all the reasons why people do things they do um because they make a catalog of products you have a website and people need to get exactly what it looks like in the mailbox and for me selling like a marbled cord of in something i have to take a picture of every single one <laughs> because yeah. they're completely different so it's a tremendous business problem to take to make a one of one take a bunch of photos of it and then sell one, it's tremendously inefficient. So I get why people do the buffing and then they do the upgrading mm -hmm. methods. Maybe Especially the big companies. I mean, like if you go on and you order a pair of, you know, white Jordans and two people order them at the same time and one's going to California and the other one's going to South Africa. I mean, Nike and the people on the other end of that purchase want those shoes to look exactly the same. I mean, they could, they could have been made in different months and they could have been made in, I mean, Nike could have made a factory change. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to throw them under, under the bus at all, but so, but those shoes still have to look the same. So that's a, that's a, just a gigantic production challenge. And they have so and, many colors. And <laughs> yeah. So you're going to do as much as, as the, as the customer, I mean, as the, as the company is producing the shoes, you're going to do as much as you can from start to finish to make those, that product as uniform as possible. But that also kind of takes the like the life out of it too, right? Where like you you've got a pair of shoes, I mean, it makes it it's you're making it into a commodity. Like you've got you can buy this shoe today or in two months or in three months or in two years. I mean, if it's that kind of product, and it's gonna be the same every single time. Where you might buy a wallet from you, and even if you buy the same you know, quote the same wallet one year versus the next year. They're different. There's enough natural variation in that product that it's not going to be exactly, exactly the same. It's going to have different markings or whatever. But, and I like that. I think that like when you get a pair of boots or shoes that has like a heel scratch on the inside heel, um, you sort of look at that and you're like, well, that's like, that's unique to this pair of boots that I have. Like no pair of, no, there's no other pair of boots that has exactly like what I'm looking at. And, well, I mean, there's only I guess, there, I, yeah. there's only certain we're way way off topic, which is great because I love this. But there's like I can fully appreciate the the business challenge and like the logistical challenge of making a thousand different leather tanges and a thousand different colors the same way every time. That's an amazing thing to do. Like that's a triumph, right? Yeah. And to your point, it sort of by necessity requires it to be commodified and the same every time you lose 
Like if you leave the leather a little bit more aniline and a little bit more naked, you, you lose all of that. But it's it's a necessity. Like you can never get, I don't know, like a natural veg is a beautiful thing, like with nothing on it. I really like that. <laughs> but not for everybody. Yeah, true. It's like yeah. like I said, I get I'll send a, like the most beautiful Dublin wallet to somebody and they're like, I don't know, like when I open it up, like it has these little lines like where it flexes. I'm like, yeah, it's the wax is it and they're like, I don't like it. <laughs> it's like okay, it's I get it. Um but Not I just I like yeah. I like that a lot too. But I guess that's why what makes uh, our, uh it gives me an opportunity to sell what I sell and you an opportunity to do what you do and other people they do smaller, cool stuff too. Um, yeah, I think it's all about. I mean, it's 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 expectations and and knowledge. I mean, it's all. It's like the like upholstery is always like a a pretty stark example. Where like most people, like myself included, depending on the piece of upholstery, they you want it to kind of look the same, like day one hundred as it does day one, because it's kind of like. But I, I also have some upholstery that I knew wasn't going to do that. And even though I knew it wasn't going to do that, like the like 14, like you're two weeks into it or three weeks and you're like, ah, I don't know, this is looking not so good. They kind of look just soiled, right? It just looks Yeah, but, the, but then you get to day 100 and you're like, oh, now that I made it through like that, that like painful, like wear in phase, now it looks awesome. So hmm. it's just, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of emotion <laughs> along the way, I guess. Or like it, it's almost easier to have something that you know is going to look the same forever versus something where you know you're going to have, there's an adjustment period. There's going to be a t- period of time where you're just not going to like the way it looks and you sort of have to work your way through that. And that's just, I think as prices go up, that tolerance goes down. I think that people, well, maybe not, maybe not directly, but because maybe people understand what they're buying because they're spending more time researching it. But I think that the, I don't think it's unusual or unnatural for you to want something that's exactly what you want the more money you spend on it. You can make it happen. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll end with this. Uh, there was one other thing I thought of. Favorite non-grain products. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference your jacket, the 316 jacket. Is it Rough Out Sonoma? Like. Mm-hmm. Tell me the story of that. It's like an anniversary jet. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it's certainly my favorite really? suede. I just love that jacket. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know why. You, uh, it's, it just speaks to me. It's got like a shimmer yeah. to it. Uh, it's a cool jacket. Yeah. Yeah. It was a. So Sonoma was normally uh, a gray now, like a soft, like a soft, yeah, gray now leather. And we, the, the way we the way we dye it and how the dye take take up happens in that leather and especially with the black like the it gives you like a really really intense black color on the on the flesh side on the rough outside and then it gets milled naturally so it like brings up the nap up further because that's like that's another way you can make things like uh, you can make the nap softer and sort of stand up is by by tumbling it in a drum so it's sort of it was something that I had noticed previously. I was like, well, that's like a really nice, like that's a really nice rough hour suede. And then, yeah, the 316 was doing an anniversary and they wanted to do a rough out. And I thought of that, and but they want, then they also want something that was going to burnish a little bit more than that was going to. So we did a little bit more stuff to the surface, which is, I think is where the, the, well, that is where the, like that, that shimmery kind of like sheen it's awesome. comes. It's not, it's a nice jacket. I should wear that more. It's a nice jacket. You could give it to me. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's it's funny because my I was talking to my dad the other day because he brought in a, a couple belts that he had had. Um, they're super nice. They're one piece marbled color eight shell quarterman belts. And like he just had a, he has two of them in like size forty that he just never never wore. And it's just like I don't know if they're not quite his his style. I'd ask him. They're not quite his style, or maybe he has a third one and he doesn't need. He only needs three. Only needs one instead of three, but he brought him in, and you know, so I, the idea is we're going to maybe accumulate some of like these one-offs that are like really nice and put them up and and uh, sell them, um, kind of like stuff that's from the archive. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea, and then I go through like my like my 
specifically like my wallet archive or my shoe archive. I'm like, I don't want to sell any of this stuff. Really? <laughs> it's like so, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's like, yeah, I've got this box that probably has, I don't know, 50 wallets in it, like that I've all that I've worn like at different, to different degrees. And like, obviously it's like so many more, like I could get rid of, you know, 45 of them and be set for the rest of my life. But mm-hmm. for some reason, I mean, some of them were like my grandfather's and like those are different, but, um, uh, did he have a suede like this really, Um, I don't think so. No, I had this really awesome, I don't know when it was made. It's like a, it's like a Pierre Cardin, like color eight shell cord of like long wallet. I don't know. It's just like, and it has like the box in it. It's probably from like the 60s or 70s or maybe the 80s. I don't know. But anyway, the a favorite non grain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a bunch of stuff. I think that I have a pair of Marine Field shoe boots. Um, that are that are probably like my most comfortable pair of shoes, like in general. Uh, so I guess it would be those. They're the there. I've also had them the for Fibergs. Yeah. yeah, I've also had them for like fifteen years, maybe. And I've had a new. They've been resold, um, maybe twice. But um, but those are like whenever I go like on a trip where I know I'm gonna be walking a lot, like I usually wear those they look like the moccasins now they look mega comfortable they're super they're those are great but i mean they're not like all that unique in in the world these days either but i had the same pair of boots in the wax flesh too which and those are awesome too but not as comfortable for whatever reason didn't wear them as much maybe probably all right Mike. well good up thanks thanks for another good episode um maybe you tell me what what have you been doing that's Relaxing these days. Um. Well, I uh, I have strep throat right now, which is pretty awesome. What? <laughs> yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I took I I took my my son woke up this morning. He's like, my throat hurts, so I took him to the pediatrician. And they're like, yeah, he has strep throat, and then my throat started to hurt. And I looked at my throat, and my throat looks exactly like his. So I'm like, I guess I have strep throat. Oh, they didn't test you though. No, I didn't test. But I just like. I just went and got a oh, I didn't an online online prescription. I didn't realize um, you were sorry if we hurt your voice or No, no, it's good. So I, I guess the I guess the I took I paused because I'm like, well hasn't I things have not been super re- relaxing. <laughs> um You gotta take time then. Yeah, I know. What are you doing that's just for you? Nothing? Uh, I mean I'm working out a little bit. I think I'm trying to get into. I'm trying to find a new, a new show to mm. watch. I don't know if you've got anything. I started watching. I do have the, something. Oh, tell me. Just tell me. Have you seen or heard of Shogun? I, I've seen it. I've heard it. It's a Hulu show. Uh, it's right up your alley. It's right up your alley. Shogun. I'll check it out. I did start watching Masters of Air. I like that show, or Masters of the Air. What's that about? Which is like, uh, it's Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg. So they did. Band of Brothers, and then they did. Oh, this Pacific. is the new, oh. and and uh, I had, and now I have like, to watch that. It's Europe. Like, they did the Pacific. Planes. Yeah, yeah. But my uh, my wife's uh, grandfather was a bombardier in a, a, in a B seventeen, and he told me. I guess he didn't share it with like a ton of people. But he, I was for some reason he told he told me like some stories about his experiences like as a bombardier and 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 they are so intense. And when I'm watching the show, all I can all I can picture is like him as like a 18 year old like sitting in the front of this plane. Like, so it's a it's a cool it's a it's on Apple. It looks like it is. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's like not. I don't want to disparage it. It's not like. Band of Brothers was like, like a really good show. I, it's not quite as good as that, but it's, I think it's like it's like a it's seven point nine IMDb and a eighty seven Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, it's good. It's worth watching. Um, are you curious to know what Shogun is? Just just to what try to uh, yeah, to try to get convince you, 
Shogun is 9.2 and 99%. Oh. Uh, I've only watched the first half of the first episode and it's it's awesome. It kind of gives me... So it takes place in the year 1600 in Japan. Is it on Apple TV? What is it on? Hulu. Oh, Hulu it's kind of a bummer. There. Honestly, the way Hulu streams is kind of garbage. It like maybe it's my internet, but like no yeah. other service uh, like changes resolution so frequently. It's like, oh, you must want it in 480 and then 4K and then 720. Yeah. It's like all over the place. Every, I hate that, but yeah. The other thing is that I've been playing Hell Divers too. If I could ever get you to play games in our life again, I would like to play that game with you. I've seen clips of that game. It looks pretty fun. It's pretty fun. <laughs> Is that it, one with the bugs in it? It's bugs, and then there's like you can also kill Terminator style robots. Which mm, is like nice, super awesome. <laughs> well, uh, it's kind of like Starship Troopers meets mm -hmm. uh, Terminator. Yeah, it sounds exactly like that. It's, based on the two things that you told me. <laughs> it, well, like so the the game itself is like straight up Starship Troopers. Like, you, we'll play. Actually, we won't because I know you'll never be able to play. I no, I would. I, maybe I'll find something I'd like to. Maybe right. I'll watch that movie. What movie? Starship Trooper. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Fine piece of cinema. Well, everybody, thanks for checking out the episode today. Hopefully, uh, we didn't go too deep and confusing. Oh, it got way deep and weird, and confusing. Oh, I'm sure. sure it was incredibly valuable. So, thanks for checking it out. And uh, if you have questions, leave them in, leave them in the comments. We had some people suggesting uh, to us, Nick, that we should have uh, somebody from Stead come on the show. Which yeah, I, it was. I would like to do. That's a good. That's a good idea. So suggestions Maybe. like that, people send them our way. We appreciate those. All right, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Phil. See you later. Bye.